So this morning, you know, amidst of these kind of things that are going on in our world today, you know, we, we wonder, you know, how can God allow these things to happen? I've entitled the message this morning, Yet Will I Rejoice. And we're going to follow kind of in the steps of an Old Testament prophet called Habakkuk. Now, it's probably been a minute or two since you last studied the book of Habakkuk, if ever. And, uh, but we're going we're gonna to go there this morning for a bit. But before I ask you to turn to Habakkuk, I want you to turn into the second book of Timothy, chapter 3. Second Timothy, chapter 3. Now, as you probably remember from previous teachings that, you know, First and Second Timothy are letters that, that Paul wrote to the young pastor named Timothy who was trying to get going, get started with a church and dealing with all the issues involved that were going on in the day. You know, false teaching and uh, immature leadership and just the growing pains of a new body of believers. And so Paul had taken Timothy under his wing and was kind of looking after him and uh, being his tutor and, and his uh, uh, educator, I guess you could call it in that way. And so the letters in, of Timothy, are, they're full of all kinds of advice, right? And counsel to Timothy. But one of the things that Paul sticks to is keeping, you know, the old Calvary Chapel, keep the main thing the main thing, right? That's really the basis of ministry. Now, besides advising Timothy on the things that were going on currently, he also wanted to give him a picture of what was going to happen in the future. So that's where we are here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Now Paul knew that his physical death was just around the quarter. It was imminent. But it seems, though, that he thought the rapture was still going to occur in his time. And if it didn't happen in his lifetime, it was going to happen very shortly after. You know, so do I. <laughs> I think it's going to happen in our lifetime. I hope it does. But you know what? Even if I'm wrong, and we're wrong about that, and Christ doesn't return for a century or two, what have we got to lose? Wouldn't you rather live your life looking for the return of our Savior and the effect that that really has on our lives? Wouldn't you really have that uh, than the alternative? But that's a message for another day. As I read through this passage from Paul, doesn't it seem as if he's vividly describing the condition of our world today? What Paul describes is not only fodder for the likes of Fox News and CNN, but also our local news outlets. The things that we see on the street every single day. Recently, Right, the World Health Organization declared an end to the COVID pandemic. And that's an event of recent times that impacted every single one of us in this room and every single other person on earth, right? And whether it was the isolation, shortage of goods, death, long-term effects of the disease within our families and our community, the open hostility of viewpoints on how to handle you know, this worldwide issue. Government failures, government overreach, all of these things. Compounding that worldwide issue with a moral decay 
that we see not only in the entertainment world, but also within government, within our education systems, our financial systems, and even in many churches. As we look across our borders, we're witnesses to the rise and fall of evil dictators, right? The recent incursion of Russia into Ukraine, right? The nearly constant saber rattling that goes on in the Mideast and the list of evil abounding in our world continues to grow. So much so, we're not really surprised by new acts, right? Or new perversions and atrocities. In fact, to some degree, I think we develop a form of mental immunity to it all because we cannot reconcile what it all means and what are we to do with it. God, how long are you going to let this stuff go on without intervening? How many times have you, have I uttered those same words? Right? When was the last time that you found yourself you know, the victim of violence, injustice, or greed, and were powerless to do anything about it. When did you last feel yourself going under, swept overboard by the pain and sorrow spilling over the border of your heart? When was the last time the Lord broke your heart over the sin and the falling away of our nation? When was the last time you felt a piercing blow of someone else's sin creeping into your life? Have you ever watched a family friend or family member being sold down the river by injustice and wanted to intervene but felt powerless to fight the system? You cried out to God in prayer, but their pain only grew more intense. All of these situations and more were weighing heavy on Habakkuk's heart. You know, he watched as his leaders and his neighbors were abusing and misusing each other. He watched the whole thing coming apart. Habakkuk had been there when the people's hearts were stirred during the revival that went on during the reign of Josiah. And he had hoped that a genuine revival would sweep the nation. But now he couldn't find evidence of it anywhere. He couldn't find the evidence that hearts had truly been transformed. Habakkuk's pleas, his prodding, his preaching, nothing seemed to sink in and cause the people to turn back to God. Habakkuk cried out to God, but in crying out for an answer, <laughs> he couldn't believe the answer that he received. Every Christian wrestles with two problems. First, why does God allow evil to prosper in the world while the righteous suffer? And the second one is, why doesn't God answer my prayers sometimes? Don't we really wrestle with those questions when, you know, that stuff really gets on us personally? We've got something going on in our families or with our friends or in our community. We really think about those things, right? The prophet Habakkuk wrestled with these sorts of questions. He's kind of unique among the prophets in that he did not, in his written message, you know, speak for God, you know, to the people. But rather he spoke to God about his struggles over these basic human questions. Why does God allow evil to go unchecked, especially when the righteous cry out to him in prayer? Now, <clears throat> Habakkuk was really disturbed in his spirit. He had felt these revival fires, you know, that flamed, you know, during the, the, you know, the time of King Josiah, but he also watched them fade. It, when I read through that, I think about, and you remember back to 9-11, the towers came down, and within a couple of days, the churches were full. Everybody loved their neighbor. The flags came out. There weren't a whole lot of disgruntlement going on, right? But what happened to that? 
it's faded with time, right? And that's a similar thing that Habakkuk had experienced. He had seen the revival that had occurred in his city, in his land, and he watched it fade away. He preached until he was hoarse. He had warned the people until he was completely worn out. He finally got in a position where he didn't believe he could communicate with his people any longer, and he turned to God with the heaviness of his heart. Now turn to the book of Habakkuk. We're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. And if you haven't been there for a while, let's see, it's on page uh, 1110 in my Bible, if that helps. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. So this morning... <clears throat> As we begin our time in this book of Habakkuk, I want to take you back to the time period of, uh, you know, we've got to go back a, a few centuries. So this is 700 to 600 B.C. Habakkuk really comes onto the scene in the, in the second half of that period, and he watches the nation of Judah rediscover the law under King Josiah's day and forget the word and will of God once Josiah was gone. Now, some of the same characteristics that we find uh, as we study ancient Judah are still with us today. I think you'll see the parallels as we continue this morning. So that's both good news and it's bad news, right? So the good news is this. Just as God worked in the past, he is working today. Let me say that again. Just as God worked in the past, he is still working today. And I'll back that up with things that you have witnessed in this very church. Those men from Team Challenge that were here. That's God's handiwork. That is God at work today. And it's going to continue tomorrow and the day after, right? Now, the bad news to this story is that we are just as vulnerable today, right, to the predicaments and perils of the people of Habakkuk's day. Right? We see it all the time. So, <clears throat> let me just say this. I think it's really important for us to understand Habakkuk's times and God's dealing with the people. You know, the stories contained in God's word haven't been put there for our entertainment. The stories of God's dealings with people have been put there for us to learn from it, right? To heed the warnings, to stir our hearts so we might seek God with passion, seek God with relentless devotion. Now, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. God has given us right, the stories of history to teach us, to draw us away from the things that sought to destroy God's people in the past. And if we're smart, we'll heed those warnings. Paul also wrote 
similar thing to the Romans. He says in, in Romans chapter 15, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. During the time of King David, Israel was united and strong. And then Solomon took over, right? And things began to deteriorate. After Solomon died, the nation of Israel divided into two nations, right? There was Judah was the southern kingdom, and Israel was the northern kingdom. In 722 BC, the Assyrians overtook the northern kingdom of Israel. Israelites were taken into captivity and carried away from their homeland. The southern kingdom of Judah is where Habakkuk lived and prophesied. And he prophesied at about the same time as, as, as Jeremiah, right? The northern kingdom had already been taken away into captivity by the time Habakkuk had begun his ministry. The capital city, the holy city of Jerusalem, was the heart of the southern kingdom. The fact that the holy city was the nation's capital didn't stop the downward spiritual spiral of the people of God. Nor did it cause God to turn his face and ignore all of the perversion and the injustice that was taking place. God kept calling his people back, but they kept marching to the beat of their own drum. Now, the fall of the southern kingdom didn't happen all at once. It actually began in 605 BC when Nebuchadnezzar had attacked Jerusalem and he took a handful of people to, to Babylon. A few years later, in 597 BC, a greater number of folks were taken captive. Then, 10 years later, in 587 BC, the walls toppled in on the holy city. Her inhabitants uh, were, many were taken captive, many were killed. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple. <clears throat> now, what was it that led to the destruction of this holy city of Jerusalem? What was it that led to the destruction of the temple of God? Those are pretty good questions, and I want to show you what happened. So we're going to take a walk through the Old Testament this morning. Now, we can trace the beginning of all this, of the end, back to a king named Manasseh. Manasseh took over the throne after his father Hezekiah died. Now, Manasseh ruled for 55 years, longer than any of Judah's kings, and he reigned from 696 to 642 BC. Manasseh's father was a godly man who brought about reform in the nation, but as soon as his father's funeral was over, Manasseh turned his back on God. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 21. It gives us some insight into Manasseh's reign of destruction on the nation of Judah. This is 2 Kings chapter 21, starting in verse 10. And the Lord spoke by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all of the Amorites who were before him, and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. That's from the words of God. Right? Now when Manasseh, when his life ended, his son Amon took over the throne. And the son picked up where his father had left off. Now turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33 starting in verse 21 tells us this. Amon was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. For Amon sacrificed all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made and served them, 
and he did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Amon trespassed more and more. After Amon was killed by his own people, his son Josiah, who was only eight years old, took over the throne. Eight years old. What were you doing when you were eight years old? Were you ready to take over the throne of your nation? <laughs> you know, I, I think about that a little bit too. And as you'll see as things play out with Josiah, he had some good parents around him. He had or grandparents or relatives and auntie, uncles. I'm not sure who. Maybe he went to VBS, right? Seeds were planted in that young man's soul. Seeds that God would nurture over time and develop into you know, great leadership kinds of things. Now, the, the story of Josiah's life is actually one of the uh, bright and shining lights in, in Judah's history. He became the king at eight, and the Lord stirred his heart when he was 16, and Josiah began to seek the Lord. When he was 20, he began to purge the nation of all its idolatry. Go to 2 Chronicles 34 in the third verse. It says, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. And then, we read of another important event that occurred in his life when he was 26, down to verse 8. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joha, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Josiah set out to restore the temple of God, to bring the people back to the house of God while he was continuing to dismantle all of this idolatry and things that his father and his grandfather had set in place. Now, while they were in the process of restoring the temple, <laughs> a strange thing happened. They discovered the law. Right? <laughs> Isn't that strange? The word of God wasn't being actively used in that temple for we don't know how long. It was hidden away. Some space, I don't know, the workmen found it. We didn't find anything like that digging the you know, debris away from the office. We already got the word of God in this church, amen? <laughs> you know, I don't wanna make light of it either, right? I don't think this isn't strange at all. The word of God is still lost in the house of God in many, many ways. Today, too often, we have church without it. We do what we want to do when we want to without ever consulting the word of God to lead us and guide us. We are guided by our whims, our desires, our anger, our passions and conscience and not by the word of God. Take a look at all the rainbows and other kind of emblems that have cropped up in the last few years, if you don't believe that. That doesn't come from the Word of God. The Word of God is lost in many of our churches today. Let me share a couple of historical anecdotes with you that I came across while preparing for today. Now, I'm going to ask the question, probably gauging on the faces that I see, there's a few gray hairs here. So how many of you remember Alexander Holzenitsyn? Anybody remember that name? Yeah, you gotta kind of dig back in the annals of time. Well, Alexander Solzhenitsyn was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature back in 1970, but the Russian government wouldn't allow him to leave the country to accept the award. He'd been put in jail for a number of years uh, and committed to internal exile someplace in Russia because his writings were highly critical of Stalinism and all that came with that. 
Eventually, he was released from exile, and his writings flourished and were read across the world. The Soviets expelled him in 1974 for treason, and he came to the United States. And although he was celebrated, right, as this symbol of anti-communist resistance, Solzhenitsyn was also extremely critical of many aspects of American society. In fact, he really called us out for what he termed as incessant materialism. Yeah. He returned to Russia in 1994 and died of natural causes in 2008. But Solzhenitsyn tells a story that when he was just a young boy, when the communist revolution was still going on, millions of Russian people were being slaughtered, right? The streets ran red with blood and fear really gripped the land. One time he overheard two peasants arguing about why all this was happening, and he said he would never forget what one of the peasants said. It is because we have forgotten God. That is why all of this is happening to us. We have forgotten God. The great author said that in spite of all the education, all the experience he has gained, including the time he spent in the, in the gulag, he never forgot the wisdom of that simple peasant, right? It is because we have forgotten God. That's why all of this is happening to us. We have forgotten God. All of this has happened to us because we have forgotten God. Those are powerful words. Amen? Do you realize that before those words were ever on the lips of any Russian citizen, the same words were spoken in America? Abraham Lincoln was president when civil war ravaged our nation. He addressed the nation with these words. Listen to this. Words of Abraham Lincoln. It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God and to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in Holy Scripture and proven by all history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And insomuch as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisement in this world, may we not justify fear that the awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which has preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Abraham Lincoln, March 30th, 1863. Now, those words, right, would certainly be dismissed if a preacher were to say those today. In fact, many preachers do say those words today, and they are vehemently. 
ignored. But think about this. That was coming from the lips of our president. Can you imagine that happening today? Our president, any of our Congress people, our governor? No, right? It's not going to happen. All of this has come upon our nation because we have forgotten God. Nations may forget about God, but God doesn't forget about nations. He is always at work seeking to draw the nations back to himself. The lessons of the Soviet Union and our nation are powerful examples, relatively recent examples of how God works in history. When a nation, any nation, forgets about God and goes about living life as they see fit, God will act to try and draw the nation, where? Back to himself. How God works is most often far different than we would imagine God working, but rest assured, God is working. Excuse me for a minute, I'm getting a little dry. Let's get back to Josiah. Now, Josiah knew what happens to a nation when it turns its back on God. Right? When the news came to Josiah about the discovery of the Lord, he tore his robes. <laughs> Read with me 2 Chronicles 34, verse 14. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law, the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing. And they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant to the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us. Because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. God's anger was aroused because the nation hadn't acted in accordance with his word, right? And that principle remains true to our day. Now, Josiah got busy and called the people to observe Passover, right? He called the people to worship. He called them away from the idolatrous worship of Asherah poles and Baal, and he called them to come before the king of glory. The word of God actually tells us that Passover had been celebrated in such a way in over 300 years. 300 years. You know, you read that, and I think about it, and it's, how have some of the things that we celebrate eroded over the years? Where did the Easter Bunny come from? Think about that. Where's the focus gone, right? You know, you would think that with the discovery of the Word of God, rebuilding of the temple, and such a powerful time of worship as the Passover, that the people's hearts would have been turned back to God. Not the case. They were going through the routine of religion, but not being transformed by submitting themselves to the King of glory. You can't stumble into church half asleep and expect a double blessing. You can dress up and try to oppress those around you, but God sees beyond our clothes to our raggedy soul. You can't go to church for your wife, you can't go to church for your husband or your mom or dad or friend 
and expect the Lord to touch your life. You can't expect him to transform your heart or to draw you to himself. You must seek him yourself. It's a very personal thing that has to occur. The people followed Josiah to church, but they didn't want to be there. They didn't see the point. They were happy doing what they thought was best, but they kept following him to church, right? Now, as soon as Pharaoh Necho of Egypt killed Josiah, after he had reigned as king for 31 years, the people turned away from God once again, under the leadership of Jehoaz, Josiah's son. Jehoaz reigned for three months as king before Pharaoh Necho put him in chains and carried him away. When Pharaoh drug Jehoaz through the city in chains, the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the people and he says this, for this is what the Lord says about Jehoaz who succeeded his father, King Josiah, and was taken away as a captive. He will never return. He will die in a distant land and will never again see his country. And the Lord says, what sorrow awaits Jehoiakim who builds his palace with forced labor he builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He doesn't pay them for their labor. He says, I will build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows. I will panel it throughout with fragrant cedar and paint it a lovely red. But a beautiful cedar palace does not make a great king. Your father, Josiah, also had plenty to eat and drink, but he was just and right in all his dealings. That's why God blessed him. He gave justice and help to the poor and needy, and everything went well for him. Isn't that what it means to know me, says the Lord? But you, you have eyes only for greed and dishonesty. You murder the innocent, oppress the poor, and reign ruthlessly. You can read that in Jeremiah chapter 22. As the people watched Jehoaz drug away in chains after serving for only three months, you to think, uh huh, open your eyes. No. They didn't. The Pharaoh made another one of Josiah's sons, uh, Jehoiakim, king, and he reigned for 11 years. And he did, also didn't follow in the steps of his father, Josiah. God's word tells us that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There those around King Jehoiakim who sought to turn the king's heart back to God, but he wouldn't listen. The king was enjoying the prosperity of his royal palace, and the people of the land were enjoying a good life, so nobody listened. When the Lord continued to call his prophets to speak the truth, right, to Jehoiakim, he became furious. And he took action. In Jeremiah chapter 26, now there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of Kerjath Jerem, who prophesied against his city and against his land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. And when Jehoiakim the king with all his mighty men and all the princes heard his word, the king sought to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. Then Jehoiakim, the king, sent men to Egypt. Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and other men who went with him to Egypt, and they brought Urijah from Egypt and brought him to Jehoiakim, the king, who killed him with a sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. That's Jeremiah chapter 26. Now, <coughs> many Bible scholars believe that it was during Jehoiakim's reign that was the time when, when Habakkuk wrote the prophecy that we have in our Bible, right? <clears throat> if that's the case, then Habakkuk was a younger prophet, you know, alongside you know, the weeping prophet Jeremiah. Habakkuk had watched the reforms of Josiah's day, and he had seen how it had all been forgotten. His heart was breaking, as was the heart of Jeremiah. But the people would not listen. He saw what was taking place in his own country. He saw how the people had turned their backs on God and were oblivious to the slippery slope that they were on. 
He was distressed not only because he saw the threat of the enemy within, but he also saw the rising power of the Chaldeans, right? Better known as the Babylonians. The Babylonians were the most godless people on the face of the planet in the eyes of those in Judah at the time. And they were certain that God would punish the Chaldeans for all their detestable ways. K. Arthur, in her book, Lord, Where Are You When Bad Things Happen, says this, people rarely think something like that will happen to the country in which they live. The Israelites didn't think it could happen in Jerusalem. After all, they were God's elect nation. Jerusalem was the home of Solomon's magnificent temple. Besides, who could be closer to the sovereign God of all the earth than Israel? You know, I think a very similar mindset <clears throat> is present in the minds of many Americans today. As talk of war continues, most Americans are certain that we would have victory over an evil guy like Vladimir Putin. I mean, he's a vile guy, he's killed his own people, as many in neighboring countries, and, and if America was going to go against, go to war against a country of integrity and decency, then we might wonder if God would be on our side. But against Vladimir Putin? No. you got to be kidding. How could God, how could anyone ever think that victory would be granted to such a ruthless despot? Well, these are the same kind of thoughts that were rambling around the minds of those in Habakkuk's day. Right? They were God's chosen people. We have the temple. We're, we're going to be good. This book of Habakkuk is unlike any other Old Testament book written by a prophet. You know, prophets by nature, right, they, they speak to the people of God and they speak for God, right? But Habakkuk had questions on his mind that he couldn't understand. And the entire book is a dialogue, right, between him and God. He couldn't understand, right, how his own people could witness the gracious hand of God at work in the nation and yet refuse to serve him. He couldn't understand how the people of his nation could witness the rise and fall of other nations, especially their relatives to the north, and believe that somehow God would not visit them in judgment if they refused to turn back to him. Habakkuk was so disturbed that God could see the injustice going on among his people and not act. Why would God not act? Well, Habakkuk would find out that God was indeed going to act, but not in a way that he could ever imagine. When we read verses 1 through 4 in this first chapter of Habakkuk, we heard his complaint to God. He said that God didn't listen to him when he cried out for help. Habakkuk said that God wouldn't save him from all that was going on. He complained that God was apathetic and inactive, even as injustice and violence was ruining Judah. Go to verse 5 in Habakkuk chapter 1. God says this to Habakkuk, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. The very first word we read from God is this, look, look more closely, Habakkuk. You may think that I'm not at work. You may think that I've sat back and watched as all of this has come about. You may think that I don't hear but I'm getting ready to do something you won't believe. Now, the Hebrew word for look means this. It means to see, look at intensely, inspect, perceive, or consider. This word is used over 1,300 times in the Hebrew Bible. In Isaiah, the Lord spoke to the prophet and told him, and he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. That's Isaiah 6, 9. Now, you and I can have... 2020 vision today and totally miss the hand of God at work in our lives. The people of Isaiah's day had eyes to see, but they had no perception of the things of God. 
The people of Isaiah's day, Jeremiah's day, and Habakkuk's day saw what they wanted to see and turned away from the work of God. We must prayerfully ask for eyes to see so that we don't miss the work of God that's going on in our midst. You got that, church? We need to pray for eyes to see that we don't miss what God is doing. Now, all of us know about experiences that we've had that were shared by other people. When the stories <coughs> began to be told by everyone about what they saw or heard, the, the stories were different. I experienced this a lot in my time when I worked for the utility. You get involved in you know, accidents or safety incidents and so forth. And so you, you talk to the individuals that were hands-on in the middle of it, and then you talk to others around them, and there's different perspectives on what's going on, right? And so you've got to look at all of these things in order to do the Paul Harvey thing. What's he say? The rest of the story, right? And so... Once again, just having eyes and ears doesn't guarantee us that we'll be able to rightly discern what's taking place or what the Lord is. We need to understand God's activities in history. Habakkuk was being called by God to look more closely at what was taking place and what was about to take place so that he could understand what God was doing. As Habakkuk watched the people of his day become increasingly blind to things of God, there's another prophet that had to deal with similar things, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 12, the Lord speaks to the prophet and says this, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear, for they are a rebellious house. With the Lord told Ezekiel, is still taking place today, right? So many have eyes to see, but there is no desire to understand what God is doing. And it's not just true of the man or woman on the street. It's also true of way too many pastors in the pulpit. The Bible teaches that God is the God of history. He is sovereign over the affairs of kingdoms and the affairs of each of our lives. But we live our lives as if God has nothing to do with the events that unfold each and every day. We have got to cry out to God to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Back in Habakkuk 1.5, right, the Lord continues after he tells Habakkuk to pay attention. God says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly astounded. The Lord's saying, in effect, Habakkuk, when you understand what I am doing, <coughs> it's going to blow your mind. You're not going to involve, believe how involved I really am when you see what I'm doing. That really is the gist of the phrase, be utterly astounded. You know, what the Lord was saying to Habakkuk is the same message that was delivered to the people of Isaiah's day. How can you tell me what's appropriate to do with my people? God deals with his people in, just, in a just way at all times, right? He doesn't pat us on the head and dismiss our sin. God desires to discipline us so that we'll return to him and find life. God tells Habakkuk he's going to be amazed when he learns about God's plan for Judah. What's gonna, what is God going to do? Let's go to verse 6. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings 
and princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Then, he cha- and then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. Nothing could have been more shocking to Habakkuk than the news that he had just received. Habakkuk couldn't believe his ears. The Babylonians, right, that ruthless, pagan, impetuous, ungodly nation was coming for his own people. Unbelievable. Why did they have such a strong feelings about the Babylonians? Well, the Babylonians were pretty despised. Plenty of reasons, right, for the people of Judah uh, to hate Babylon. In 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar gave the Egyptians a, a good whipping in the battle of Carchemish. That's a, you can read about that in Jeremiah chapter 46. Nebuchadnezzar made his way into Judah and took some of the young promising leaders back to Babylon with him. One of the young leaders that was carried away from his home was Daniel. You can read about Daniel in that book of Daniel. You know, as a result of Daniel's unyielding commitment to the Lord, he suffered persecution, scorn, ridicule. Daniel interpreted dreams for the king that foretold of Babylon's demise. He wouldn't compromise God's message to try and get on Nebuchadnezzar's good side. He told him the truth. Daniel's Hebrew friends were thrown into the fiery furnace, right, because of their faith. Later on, when Daniel was an old man, he was thrown into a lion's den to be mauled by hungry lions because he would not bow his knee to any god but Yahweh, the God of Israel. Everywhere the Babylonians went, they carried their idolatry, false religions with them. When Habakkuk heard the news that God was going to raise up such an ungodly nation to discipline his own people, Habakkuk was stunned. Not only was Habakkuk stunned because Babylon was a nation filled with idols and false gods, but he was also shocked because Babylon was a bully. During Joachim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon and he invaded Judah and made Jehoiakim a vassal of his throne. After Nebuchadnezzar's invasion, the Aramaeans, Moabites, Ammonites came against Jehoiakim and the people of Judah. Babylon was a bully. A violent bully who didn't care about anything but gaining more power. Sound like anybody in the world today? Habakkuk couldn't understand how God could use such a violent nation to carry out his will. When you study the characteristics of Judah that are listed by Habakkuk in verses 1 through 4, you read things like right, violence, injustice, destruction, conflict, strife. Now remind me what kind of people were the Babylonians. <laughs> Violent, impetuous, hot-headed. They were their own gods. They made their own rules. Sounds to me like God was going to send somebody that looked just like his people. That God would use a heathen nation like Babylon was too much for Habakkuk to believe. It's a great lesson in this for us today. Does God's hand still continue to raise up and bring down nations? Make no mistake about it. God is not weak. God is not apathetic. And we really need to ask, how is God's hand moving in America today? How is God's hand moving in the world today? with all the strife, conflict, and violence taking place in our country and around the world, we need to cry out to the Lord to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and an understanding heart so that we can discern the work of God in our own day. Before we leave here today, I want to draw one lesson from our time of study that we can carry with us as we leave this time of worship this morning. God still acts in history. The events that take place around you and me every day in our own personal lives, in the life of our nation and world are designed to draw us back to God, to seek him with all of our hearts. That should be our passion. 
Our passion to seek the Lord with all of our hearts should lead us straight to God's word. Just as the nation of Judah lost the word of God and were led into all kinds of despicable sin, so you and I can so easily lose the word of God by neglecting it in our lives. It's not enough to come to church. It's not enough to have a Bible. It's not enough to visit modern day temples or houses of God or listen to Christian radio or all of those things. God's word has to transform you and me as we submit to it each and every moment of every day. We must heed its warnings, submit to its instruction, and repent when God's word shines a light on the error of our ways. Our first step to God is to confess that we are sinners and that apart from his grace, we are destined to destruction and eternal separation from God. We must recognize that God has provided for our sin by giving his son, Jesus Christ, as payment for our sin so that we might be forgiven. I want to invite you this morning to confess your sin to God and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you haven't done so already. One last scripture for this morning. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This passage is so important because it says God's people have a responsibility for the society in which they live. If our country is going down the tubes, we have to take personal responsibility because we're responsible to heal wounds and light the way. Jesus calls us to be salt and light of the earth. If we're going through difficulty and chaos as a nation, we as believers have got to say, Lord, we've been failing. Have we been playing and not praying? Lord, allow us to pray, right? It's easy for anyone to curse the darkness of society. We can all point our fingers, right? But we have to be that light. We have to be praying rather than complaining. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time this morning. We thank you for giving us the words of Habakkuk and giving us the history of Josiah and the other kings and showing us how the very many different ways that you work. Father, more importantly, I pray this morning that you would stir in our hearts the passion to understand your word each and every day, to commune with you. And Father, we pray for those eyes to see and ears to hear in understanding of the work that you are doing within our world today. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this house of worship that you've provided for us. We love you. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.